Any questions? Uh, you'll have to get, uh, just make sure again. I can't see hands being raised. I was just going to give a reminder that if you're on WebEx, open the participant panel and press the raised ha hand icon if you wish to ask a question via the audio queue. If you are on, on the phone, please press star three and you will be put in the audio queue. There are currently no questions. Okay. Thanks. Keep plugging along then. So, uh, DMM, we, so we perform a, uh, we do an optimization, uh, using day and real time market prices and, uh, and unit characteristics for a, uh, a typical hypothetical combined cycle unit in order to estimate, uh, net market revenues, uh, from hypothetical units uh, this graph shows, uh, the estimated net market revenues from a hypothetical combined cycle unit. That's the green bar. Uh, in 2023, we do that for a hypothetical unit in both SP15 area and the NP15 area. Uh, we see in 2023 that the estimated net market revenues for a combined cycle unit fell to $28 per kilowatt year in NP15 and $33 per kilowatt year in SP15. Uh, this graph, uh, we kind of comparing those net market revenues to DMM's estimates of going forward fixed costs, kind of these translucent bars. A little bit kind of a wide estimate there. I would see that in 2023, for the most part, net market revenues for a hypothetical combined cycle unit were less than uh, than estimated going forward fixed costs. Um, we also compare net market revenues here to this using this 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 uh, the gold line, which is uh, an estimate of levelized fixed costs for uh, for a combined cycle unit. So that's going forward fixed costs plus uh, you know uh, capital costs of you know financing the unit. Um, and so again, uh, and, and we also add in this, the, the blue bar blue bar is the, uh, it's the annual, uh, level annualized annual annualized value of the, of the, uh, the capacity procurement mechanism soft offer cap. And so that's based on the, the California energy commission's, uh, estimate of going forward estimate of going forward fixed costs or kind of a high, it's a high estimate of going forward fixed costs for, uh, for gas, for gas unit. Um. And so, and so we, we have that in, so, you know, we, we, we add that in there, uh, uh, in order to, um, uh, help show the, how the, how the combined, uh, uh, revenues from net market revenues, plus a potential high estimate of, 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 or an estimate of what a resource that was receiving the capacity procurement mechanism would receive for capacity revenues. Uh, if it, if it, uh, if it, if it was receiving uh, a capacity procurement mechanism designation for the whole year. Um, jump to the next graph here. So this is the exact same graph, but for a hypothetical, com hypothetical combustion turbine. I uh, would see the net market revenues for hypothetical combustion turbine fell to uh, $20 per kilowatt year in NP15, $27 per kilowatt year in SP15. I'd say that kind of the main point of these graphs is 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 really to kind of show besides kind of showing what what maybe what an estimated net market revenue for a hypothetical unit might be it is to kind of highlight that that we you know that that the net market revenues are not expected to cover going forward fixed costs right for many for some years estimate, estimate net market revenues do cover going forward fixed costs uh but some for many years they do not um and then similarly um uh they estimated market revenues are, are clearly well below uh, uh, the estimated levelized fixed cost for these types of units. Um, and so, I, you know, I think that what that highlights is that, um, for resources in the CAISO and, you know, in, in the ISO markets for resources to be able to recover going forward fixed costs and to, to be able to recover their levelized, uh, fixed costs. It is, it is critical that resources, uh, assign. Uh, long, you know, longer term contracts, you know, the bilateral contracts for energy or capacity in order to cover their capital costs. And then also, and even when their initial contract and when they're off their initial contract in order to cover going forward to fixed costs, uh, the, you know, the, the Kaiso market design does assume that resources are going to uh, receive uh, capacity contracts for, uh, you know, resource adequacy contracts or, you know, contracts for capacity to make sure they cover going forward fixed costs. 
like the Kaiser wholesale market design uh, in terms of the way it's the way it forms prices as not designed uh, to to help resources you know to make sure resources cover any of their fixed costs instead of, right the, the 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 pricing design is is, is intended to uh, create prices to uh, to get the optimal dispatch and incentivize resources to bid their their true marginal costs and to uh, and and then and then to uh, to then follow the uh, the optimal dispatch that comes out of the the optimization. Okay, we're going to move on to uh, more regional uh, issues. So with that, another another opportunity to stop for uh, a couple more questions, or questions. The first question, actually, even if someone has a question. Hi, right, this is Michelle Keto from the Energy Division. I have a quick question on the previous slide. When you're calculating net market revenues, I assume that you're calculating revenues minus costs. When you're doing the costs, are you using the default energy bids and what kind of markup does that include on the gas price? Okay, boy, for some of these different analyses, we, uh, uh, we do, um, an average, so we do diff we do different scenarios. Um, so I believe, and again, we have, I, we do a bunch of these different studies for different reasons here. So for this one, I believe we do different scenarios, some of which include uh, a ten percent markup on costs, and some that and some that don't, and we might average them. But that's you know, I, the exact detail that I'd, I'd have to dig into the report. It's the, it's okay. the that's the exact detail that it, it is listed in the section in this section of the end report. But I definitely get some of those details mixed up with. With, uh, with with some of the other uh, some of the other analyses we do, such as the uh, the, uh, the 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 competitive the markup of also costs relative to competitive baseline. Okay, I'll, I have another question about that, but I'll ask yep. that one and I'll look at the report. Okay, thank you very much. Yep, yep. Thanks for the question. First first question of the day. Appreciate it. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Okay, so moving on to some uh, more uh, topics, uh, uh, regional topics here. So this graph shows the um, uh, monthly average day ahead uh, uh, load weighted day ahead price for the for the the, the two biggest uh, load areas in Kaiso and the the dotted lines there, and it compares those monthly day ahead average prices to the monthly average uh, uh, day ahead prices at the major um, bilateral electricity hubs in the West. Uh, and that's, uh, and, and it's, the, it's the prices for the, the peak product um, at those hubs. So mid Columbia bilateral, monthly bilateral, bilateral prices are in blue. Uh, Palo Verde peak monthly bilateral average prices are in yellow. Uh, for this, we see here uh, the mid C prices. Uh, you know, over the course of the year, Mitzi prices were significantly higher than Kaiso prices. Particular Mitzi prices were uh, were significantly higher than Kaiso in February to April, and uh, June to October. Also noteworthy here, the Palo Verde prices in yellow uh, in the southwest there were were well above the Kaiso prices in July and August. So that uh, those higher regional prices there uh, would contribute to. Uh, uh, some of the what we're going to see here in terms of uh, imports and exports uh, uh, from Kaiso relative to the uh, the rest of the West. Uh, so this is a busy, it's a busy graph here. Um, this shows uh, imports and exports uh, uh, um, into and out of the uh, Kaiso area. The dark blue, dark yellow, the dark blue bars and dark yellow line on the positive side, those are imports into the KISO balancing area over the intertie constraints. On the negative side of the, of the axis, uh, we see the light blue and light yellow lines, those are exports out of the KISO balancing area. Uh, for the sake of kind of focusing discussion here, let's, let's focus on the dotted black, the dotted black, the dotted black lines. The dotted black line, that is the net import and net imports into the Kaiso balancing area uh, for each hour. Um, again, that's netting the imports in minus the exports out of Kaiso. This graph is showing, uh, so it's showing for each quarter of 2023, it's showing the, the same quarter from the year before. Uh, so we can see here looking at the dotted black lines, 
you know, for say Q1 2022 compared to Q1 2023, and for each, right, each quarter, the dotted black line, we see that the net imports into the CAISO balancing area were significantly lower in uh, 2023 compared to 2022. Uh, in fact, on an average hourly basis, net imports into CAISO fell 2,027 megawatts per hour. Um, the gray line now, when we're attention to the gray line, the gray line incorporates, it adds on net WEIM transfers into the CAISO balancing area onto the, uh, the net imports. So when the gray line is below the dark, black, dark the, uh, the black dotted line, when the gray line is below the black dotted line, that indicates that WIM transfers were out of the CAISO balancing area. So WIM transfer exports out of the CAISO balancing area. So when you look at that, the, the gray line, the net interchange in 2023, it's, it, I think it's, it's, a, it's significant to note that for every quarter in 2023, during this middle of the day solar hours, CAISO is a significant next net exporter of power. Um, and again, that's, you know, that's, that's going to be due to uh, uh, increasing solar production in the CAISO balancing area, but also, it, you know, it, it could be, it's, Right, increasing those kind of exports this year would be the the low CAISO, relatively low CAISO load um, that we saw earlier in the presentation, and also the high hydro production um, in CAISO um, compared to uh, kind of tighter hydro in the Northwest. So the Western Energy and Balance Market expanded in 2023. Uh, three balancing areas joined the WEIM, El Paso Electric, WAPA Desert Southwest, um, and Avangrid joined WEIM on April 5th, 2023. Uh, this graph is focused on uh, load measures, so we actually don't see Avangrid on this uh, because they're a generation-only balancing area. Uh, El Paso Electric and uh, WAPA, uh, so the graph on the left here shows the average load for non-CAISO uh, WIM areas, uh, El Paso and WAPA, their peak load, uh, was about, uh, 4,900, 5,000 megawatts combined, uh, or sorry, sorry, uh, sorry, almost 4,000 megawatts combined was their, was their, their peak load. Um, uh, so it increased, increased load a little bit, uh, in 2023 compared to 2022. Um, but notice, but I think what's noteworthy here is that these three areas, while the increase in, uh, WIM load, uh, uh, was was not large. The three areas combined did add, on average, six thousand nine hundred seventy megawatts of transfer capacity between you know, between themselves and other areas in the WIMs. That 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 did that that large increase in transfer capacity did significantly improve the structure of uh, of the real time markets in the in the ISO and WIM chart on the right. Um, so it shows on the left hand side shows each balancing area's peak load in 2023. Um, and then the right-hand side shows each balancing area's load during the WEIM system peak. Uh, the, so total load across the WEIM uh, footprint, it peaked on August 16th, hour and 18. That was the same actually hour as the CAISO uh, uh, peak. Um, and so the, the peak for WEIM overall was 130, 130, over 130,000 megawatts. 68% uh, of this load is from balancing areas outside the California ISO. Um, so, it's, I think, you know, something else that I, I kind of is noteworthy from this, this chart is we see that for uh, several of the areas in the Pacific Northwest, their overall annual peak was in the winter, say January or February. Uh, so, I'm looking here, I don't know, let's say that's uh, at Puget with the annual peak January 30th at 4,500 megawatts. But I, I know it's noteworthy that during the, the, the system peak on August 16th, most of these areas in the Northwest, their, their load at that time was still pretty high. So while their annual peak was in January, February, uh, they, they are kind of, they do kind of have a uh, kind of two peaks. Uh, they do because their, their load during the, uh, the, the, the instantaneous WIM peak was generally uh, not too much below what their overall annual peak in the winter was. Usually about you know 80, 85 to ninety five percent of their of the annual peak. So this graph is showing the average hourly participate participating non CAISO WEM generation by fuel type. Uh, is again this is noteworthy to note here is that 
This is just the participating generation, right? All generation in W and non Kaisa WM areas are not required to participate. A lot of their, a lot of the supply does come from, uh, from non participating generation. So this is just showing, the uh, the participating generation is non Kaisa WM areas that uh, that we have that we have visibility more visibility into. Uh, this chart. Uh, if you notice here, uh, kind of a steady average baseline over the, over the hours of the day of coal. Then on average, right, a pretty steady contribution from uh, wind on average. Um, and we see, but we also see a, 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 a significant solar production during the middle of the day solar hours. During these hours, when solar has, you know, when there's high solar production, we see that tending to decrease uh, the production from natural gas units. That's the light blue bars. Um, and also decreasing the production from hydro resources, which is the, the dark blue bars. Then as the sun goes down, the solar production decreases as you get over the, uh, the evening net load peak. When solar production goes down, we see uh, the increase in natural gas generation and hydro production to uh, fill in for the decreasing solar. Uh, this graph shows the same, it's the same, same graph, right? The hourly average generation by fuel type, but for the KISO balancing area. Uh, for this, what stands out uh, is a significantly high proportion of generation in the middle of the day comes from solar production. So, when solar is producing a large amount in the middle of the day, we see a much larger, de we see a, a really large decrease in natural gas production as we did in the, the, uh, the non Kaisa WIM areas, decrease in hydro production as the sun goes down, we see an increase in natural gas production and in, in increase in hydro. Um, so, again, for, the, for, for Kaisa over here, we're showing in red the, uh, the net imports. Right, again, for the WIM areas, uh, uh, the, the, the bilateral imports in those areas are non-participating, so we don't include them in those graphs. But for KISO, we look at the uh, net imports in red. Uh, and, and for the, those net imports, we also see those, those red, red net imports decreasing even down to zero and becoming a slightly negative during some of the, on average, during the, the solar hours. Um, this graph, we also see the dotted, the dotted black bars. Those are net WIM imports into KISO. So during the evening hours, uh, you know, the early morning and evening hours, we see Kaiso as a net, uh, small net importer of WM import transfers. But then during the solar hours, in the middle of the day, uh, the Kaiso balancing area was a, was a significant uh, exporter of WM transfers out of Kaiso. Uh, we also see battery here in the light blue bars. Uh, we see the batteries uh, being uh, charging significantly on average in the middle of the day. And then contributing, and as you go to the, those peak, uh, those peak net load hours in the evening, and even over the peak net load into hour twenty two and twenty and, uh, and hour twenty three, we see batteries contributing a significant amount of discharge capacity, uh, which obviously uh, helps to reduce uh, reliance on imports and natural gas and hydro resources. Okay, there's another opportunity to stop for, uh, for a couple of questions. Before I move on to prices, price decomposition. Any questions from it? Any questions from the crowd? Yolanda, can we know if any, anyone has their hand raised? Dark. Yes, we have one question in queue. Okay. Uh, hey, Ryan, thanks for the presentation. I'm Cameron Reed with Puget Sound Energy. Uh, I just wanted to ask real quick if you had any. If, if you're going to be getting to it or not, that's fine. But any investigation into why mid sea prices are high? Is it the tight hydro conditions, or um, you have any indication of that? The cause of that? Uh, no, I mean that's that's that's. I, mean, I would say that's that's not something that we have uh, done a. Uh, in, or, yeah, that's that's not an investigation that, that that I plan on getting into today. But yeah, I think it's, I think it's a, that's a reasonable, a reasonable. Uh, uh, first, first hypothesis there: the tight hydro, hydro conditions would could increase uh, uh, the prices in mid sea. Yeah, thank you. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? There are currently no other questions in queue. Okay. All right. So moving on to discussing prices and price decomposition, uh, an important part of the, uh, the ISO's market design. In the in the in the WEIM is its design for uh, the California Air Resource Board CARBS uh, GHG gas compliance instruments. Uh, so 
the ISOs design for this uh, 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 can significantly impact dispatch of resources in WIM areas and CAISO areas, and can also uh, significantly impact prices as the uh, the price on that on the ISO's greenhouse gas constraint will decrease prices in uh, in non California WIM areas relative to uh, electricity prices in. Uh, in, in California balancing areas in the WEIM. Uh, so quick review of that, right? So uh, resources that get deemed delivered to California uh, outside of California areas, uh, they need to uh, purchase and, and provide uh, compliance instruments to CARB. Uh, but in return, uh, they receive payment uh, uh, that's based on the cost of the greenhouse gas uh, constraint in, in, the, in the ISO's market. Uh, so this chart is showing the bars, the blue bars are the 15 minute quantity, the hourly average uh, 15 minute uh, quantity of, 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 of megawatts deemed delivered to California by month for uh, each of the last three years. Again, the blue bars is the 15 minute market quantity deemed delivered. The green bars are the, uh, the, the incremental five minute market uh, quantity of power deemed delivered to California. Um, and then the lines here show the G, that, that GHG constraint price. The light blue line is the, the GHG constraint price in the 15 minute market. The green line is the GHG constraint price in the five minute market. Uh, weighted FMM prices were about, uh, in 2023, were about $11 per megawatt hour. Uh, While well, the five minute market prices averaged about $7 per megawatt hour in 2023. These prices were similar on average in 2022 when the average FMM price was also $11 and the average five minute market price was $6 per megawatt hour. All right, um, so this chart shows the average hourly five minute market prices um, in, the, in the, all the balancing areas across the WAM as well as uh, the three major, or the two, two major CAISO uh, load areas, SE and PG&E. Uh, the, uh, and this again, so yeah, this is the average hourly price. So you see an average hourly price for each of the 24 hours, again, for the five minute market. Um, the, the size of the relative size of the price is color coded to help with interpreting the graph. So, uh, the system marginal energy costs, kind of the average cost across the whole system. That'll be in white here on the top line. As you get to, uh, uh higher prices. Above that, above the system marginal energy price, uh, the, the colors become yellow and then darker orange for the highest prices. And uh, lower prices are, are prices below uh, the average that the, the SMEC are going to show up in light blue. And you get and the, the, that color will become darker blue as prices become lower, relatively lower compared to the that uh, system average price. Um, I see something to note as we talk about decomposition here, in these next few slides. The three areas that joined WAM, they joined in April. So that was WAPA, El Paso Electric, um, and Avangrid. Grid. The, you know, they, they joined in April. That was kind of after the really high prices from high from high natural gas prices in the first quarter. So they do kind of stand out as outliers. So I tend to not not incorporate them into, into kind of the, the the story I might tell for what the trends are uh, for the year, just because they they did they did join after those those kind of high price high price months. So uh, what stands out from this graph is in the middle of the day, the solar hours. In the middle of the day, uh, we see a trend of power flowing from southern areas, so the desert southwest areas, uh, southern California, into the north, so into uh, Pacific Northwest um, and Intermountain West, and into Northern California. So those areas in the middle of the day have a, have a higher, have brighter, a yellow or brighter orange color. And in the evening hours, uh, in the evening hours since they're already 20 to 24, we tend to see. Uh, uh, prices um, uh, a little bit higher in California relative to relative to the West, and a, and a little bit of a, a trend of uh, power of you know of of prices of power going uh, from north to south. So it's a little bit higher prices in the north than in the south, but a lot of the separation there in those evening hours uh, can be attributed. You know, the higher prices in California can be attributed to those uh, the greenhouse gas prices uh, that we talked about in the previous slide. So this slide is showing the average the average annual price for East Fountain area over all of 2023, and it breaks that the, the that average price down. This is for the five minute market. It breaks that price down by 
uh, by price component, the component of the location of marginal price. The blue bar is the, uh, the SMEC, it's the system marginal energy price. And again, that should be the same for all areas, except for the three that joined uh, in, in April, we see there on the right. Um, the line, the, the dark, the, the blue line shows the, the, the overall LMP and the bars show uh, each area's, uh, uh, how that LMP is broken down by component. Uh, noticeable here, we see that green bar, that which is the, the GHG component of price, right? Uh, uh, re pushing down prices in non-California WM areas relative to California areas. Uh, we see the yellow bar, that's the flow-based congestion, so congestion on constraints such as path 26 within CAISO. We see that that uh, that congestion was generally uh, uh, going from south to north. So the congestion was kind of the flow-based congestion was pushing down prices in the desert southwest and southern California relative to prices in uh, northern California and the northwest. But then I'd say the most kind of significant uh, takeaway I want uh, I want people to take away from this chart, and we'll talk about it a little more in the next chart, is the red bars. And that's the transfer. That's the congestion from WM transfer constraints. In the five minute market, notice that the transfer congestion uh, is, is from California or from, sorry, from CAISO balancing area in the five minute market on average and into other balancing areas. So the transfer is generally from, from CAISO balancing areas. We see transfer congestion in the red bar, positive red bars, right? So it shows transfer congestion into Pacific Northwest areas, into Intermountain North, into Intermountain West areas, and even some transfer congestion on average into desert southwest areas and again that's that's uh the from the five minute market now this graph is the same graph but it's showing the average annual prices for each balancing area but it's the 15 minute market prices notice here is that this is this graph is you know it, it is significantly different than the picture for the five minute prices um this gets to part of the story i was talking about early in the presentation about the 50 minute market prices being different from the five minute market prices in CAISO uh, that also applied in a lot of the WIM. So you notice in this graph now, looking at the red transfer congestion, the congestion in the 15 minute market was, uh, uh, the transfer congestion was generally pushing down prices in the desert Southwest, uh, say Nevada, Arizona, SRP, Tucson, um, and also in LA, so Southern California. Um, so the transfer congestion is generally uh, uh, pressing down prices in the desert southwest relative to uh, uh, to balancing areas in the uh, uh, to to the Kaiso balancing area. So again, five minute market prices we tended to see transfer congestion from Kaiso to the northwest and some and you know into other and, and to other balancing areas. In the fifty minute market, we see the transfer congestion from the desert southwest into into Kaiso. So different different pattern there to note. Okay, so now uh, we'll talk about one of the one of the significant causes of of this uh, of kind of these different prices in the fifteen minute market and the five minute market. Um, so this is something that uh, so the Kaiso balancing area. So they they limited WM transfers in into Kaiso in the hour end market and the fifteen minute market, but not the five minute market. And they did that from July twenty sixth to November fifteenth, twenty twenty three. This is something that uh, that I highlighted a uh, decent amount in my, my presentation on the Q3 report and the Q4 report. Um, we could probably talk about this for an hour, um, but I'll try to, I'll just try to hit some of the, some of the highlights here uh, over the course of like five to seven minutes. Um, so what this chart is showing here, uh, our WEM import, the dynamic WEM import transfers into CAISO from some of the tightest days in the year, July 24th and July 27th. The blue bar show dynamic WM transfers, import transfers into CAISO in the hour ahead market. The red bars show the dynamic WM transfers into the CAISO balancing area in the five minute market. The green line on July 26th, July 27th there, those show the hours in which the ISO uh, began implementing the limit of WM transfers into CAISO in the hour and 50 minute market. So what we notice here is, so let's say look at uh, July 25th. We see in the blue bars, we see WIM transfers in the hour market into CAISO during, you know, most during during these hours, during all hours. Uh, and we also see right the, the red bars that were showing five minute transfers, uh, WIM import transfers into CAISO during all hours. But then starting July 26th, hour ending, uh, hour ending 20, 
uh, that we see with the green line there, that that is the hour when ISO started uh, limiting transfers in the hour market and 50 minute market. So we see no blue bars there, so indicating no dynamic transfers into uh, into Kaiso in the hour market. But we do see uh, 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 red bars, which is the the, the uh, dynamic transfers in the five minute market. So again, this 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 limitate the the transfer limitation was implement, implemented in the hour and 15 minute market, but not the five minute market. So what this did was, you know, this this did contribute to uh, to uh, a systematic modeling difference in the 15 minute market relative to the five minute market across the WIM. Um, so what they contributed to uh, having higher prices in the CAISO balancing area in the 15 minute market and relatively lower prices in uh, in other WIM areas in the 15 minute market, particularly the desert southwest. Um, you know, so there's there's uh, obviously transfer, you know, so that the price differences were, were caused by uh, uh, transfer congestion due to no power being able to flow into the or very much more limited power being able to flow in the CAISO balancing area in the 15 minute market. But then when that when those transfer limitations were, were not there in the five minute market, then power could then uh, flow from other areas into the CAISO balancing area, which then helped uh, you know, lower cost supply to uh, bring down prices in CAISO and make prices more more equal uh, between Kaiso and surrounding balancing areas in the in the five minute market. Uh, so why did Kaiso? Um, why has Kaiso said that they they implemented this uh, this, this transfer limitation hour and hour and fifty minute market? Uh, let's focus here on July twenty fifth, hour and nineteen. Let me turn a highlighter on here. Let's see this. So July twenty fifth, hour and nineteen. You see here is that in the hour ahead market. Uh, uh, the blue bars there. There are a significant amount of of, uh, of WM import transfers in the hour end market, uh, about 2,500 megawatts. But then in the five minute market, none of those WM transfers into Kaiso materialized. And so Kaiso's described this. You know, this this is a significant reliability issue. Uh, this is one of the tightest days of the year. And so, um, if in the hour end market, if the the market was seeing supply. Significant amount of supply that then did not materialize in the five minute market that could create a liability issue uh, for for Kaiso and for the exports ultimately that 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 Kaiso was committed to serving. Um, so, but then the question though is is and and I think it's where most probably most future discussion, uh, uh, a lot of future discussions still warranted is you know so what what is it what's what's going on in the market which would cause in these tight conditions. Uh, transfers WM transfers into Kaiso in the hour market to not materialize in the five minute market, and I think I want to focus on 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 one particular cause, which is a potential uh, uh, you know structural design issue in the ISO markets. It's something we wrote about in a board in a public uh, board memo to the board and governing body a few months ago, and that's related to exports uh, export curtailments. So uh, for this hour and also similar uh, hour in nineteen July twenty sixth. Uh, the Kaiso balancing area significantly increased the load, this load bias used in the hour head market. And something we'll talk about in the next slide. They do this to, uh, you know, to, to try to get more imports and to, in, you know, to get more supply into, into their area. But in doing so, increasing that, having a load bias is 4,000 or 5,000 megawatts in the hour head market. Uh, that resulted, it helped, that contributed to a large number, I think around 4,000 megawatts of exports that it's self scheduled out of the Kaiso balancing area. It's, it's relevant about 4,000 megawatts of exports that had self scheduled not receiving awards in the hour ed market. So, if we think about, uh, you know, these thousands of megawatts that have self scheduled exports out of the Kaiso balancing area in the hour ed market, lots of many of those are actually ultimately sinking in WEIM areas. Um, and so, in the hour end market, when a WM area submits its base schedules to the to the optimization, it's submitting the it's submitting that power it expects to get from Kaiso as self scheduled, you know, bilateral import supply. So the hour end market sees that as supply that's going to be there, that's going to that's going to be available to those WM balancing areas. But the, when the hour end market ultimately cuts those exports, doesn't allow those to flow, the hour market still it still sees it still sees that supply. As being available to WM areas, so then it, it, it would see those WM areas as having excess supply, which could then flow back as WM transfers into Kaiso in the hour market. However, right because the hour market has actually cut those exports, by the time you get to the five minute market for this hour, hour nineteen, uh, that supply is no longer there for the WM areas. WM, WM areas were actually you know did not have you know thousands of megawatts of supply 
uh, which their base schedules thought they were going to have because those those that supply ultimately was sourced from exports out of the CAISO balancing area uh, that were cut. So, uh, you know, I think that's, you know, that's, that's a, uh, you know, and, and, you know, th and that, that can create uh, significant reliability issues. Um, so, let's see, we've, we've recommended uh, over the course of this year uh, that the ISO uh, provide more uh, transparency, discuss more, um, uh, you know, why the ISO has, uh, why the ISO uh, did use these, these transfer limitations into the CAISO. Uh, when they may use them in the future, and we hope that that may, you know, uh, contribute to discussions about alternative measures, alternative methods for accomplishing the same reliability goals. Um, and I think, you know, what the, and that, and that ISO has 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 done has given several good presentations to provide more clarity on this. Uh, in particular, they, they've done a lot of discussion, which I think kind of supports what I talked about in terms of the major concern here being hours where exports out of the CAISO self schedule exports may be cut. So uh, when they ISO ultimately use these import transfer limitations uh, through November fifteenth, and one of the main reasons they listed for why they stopped doing the trend, these uh, these limitations on November fifteenth was that that's the day when they implemented a software enhancement to help the CAISO balancing area deal better handle situations when the hour when when the hour market has has cut uh, ex substitute exports out of the CAISO. Um, so, I, so I, I do think that doesn't that, that indicates that the hours of kind of significant concern um, uh, that that would cause the ISO to use the trench limitation were related to hours when the ISO may be cutting uh, export self schedules in the hour end market. Um, and so, again, the ISO has uh, turn off the point here. The ISO has increased uh, has has done a lot of discussion on this issue, um, and uh, I think it's you know it's it's important to note that. They did uh, during during this recent July heat wave, uh, in which conditions were tight, and there was significant risk of the ISO not scheduling all self scheduled exports out of the hour end market during the, the, the this, this recent you know July twenty twenty four tight conditions. The ISO did not utilize uh, uh, these these import limitations. So I think the ISO has you know has 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 uh, is is significantly scaling back the extent to which it it uh, it is it is utilizing this tool, um, but. I do think that um, more discussion, such as such as what I just discussed, this dynamic between uh, cuts to export trans cuts to exports at a CAISO and how that may, and how that may actually cut the supply in WIM areas, kind of I think is it, it, it is worthwhile. We continue to recommend that the ISO uh, has more discussions on some of the structural issues with the CAISO design, which may result in in these WIM transfers in our in the hour and market not materializing. In the five minute market, uh, because we think uh, more discussion over that may help uh, 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 to develop uh, alternative solutions that may uh, further reduce the, 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 the instances in which the ISO may have to uh, implement these trans limitations, which again, it, it does create a systematic, uh, a large systematic modeling difference between the 15 minute market and the five minute market. So we do encourage the ISO to continue uh, working on this issue and discussing with stakeholders. Okay, so that was kind of my. my Longest slide there, so let's stop there for questions. We have a question in the chat from Jordan Miner. Can you explain why not why they did not limit the five minute market? Uh, yeah. So I think so. Again, the issue, the issue, the issue. You know, I, so allowing transfers to ultimately flow in the five minute market is a good thing, right? So because you, you I mean, you want trans. The ISO would want transfers to flow in, in all markets, ideally. And so in the five minute market line transfers to flow still allowed resources that were online and excess capacity available. Excess capacity was available to flow into CAISO and you know to ultimately kind of wheel through CAISO into other balancing areas. So so you know, so not limiting the five minute market, that was you know, that was that was that was clearly a good thing. So you know, the issue is with issue is then, you know, why are they limited in the 15 minute market, um, an hour in market, which which is what I explained, which is to to help to help prevent a potential reliability concern, which is the uh, which is by lip which is in the 15 minute market in the hour end market if that optimization is seeing a whole lot of supply flowing into kaiso right to support load to support exports in the hour end market if that isn't if that isn't actually going to materialize in the five minute market for again for some reasons i discussed there and some other reasons as well uh that that you know that could create a reliability issue uh but by limiting those transfers in the hour and 15 minute market um then then the optimization 
would then rely on other sources, other, you know, other source of supply, which are more likely to actually materialize in real time, such as, you know, hourly block imports and committing more resources. Hope that helps explain that. Any other questions? Jordan says, thank you. Great. Uh, are there any other questions on the line? This question is about when the recording will be available and that will be in a few business days after today's event. Okay. Anything else before I move on? All right, moving on. So another, um, this slide uh, goes over another uh, significant operator uh, uh, intervention in the market, which contributed to 15 minute market prices and did, you know, and then by extension, like I discussed earlier, uh, prices being higher than five minute market prices. So this graph shows um, the average hourly adjustment that CAISO balancing area operators make to uh, uh, the hour, the load forecast used in the hour market, and those are the solid lines. And it also shows the, the average hourly adjustment that operators make to the load forecast in the five minute market. And those are the dotted lines. And this, so we show these for each of the last three years. Um, so operators, especially looking here from is the hour ending 16 to 22, uh, operators can increase the load forecast, which is used in the hour and market and the five minute market. Um, but the, by increasing the uh, the load forecast used in, in the hour and market above what the actual load forecast is, the operators can uh, can eat, the operators will often use this, especially over that that evening net load peak to address uncertainty that might materialize between the start of that hour and market run, which is about you know, 67, 68 minutes before the start of the hour. So it's to address uncertainty, the uncertainty that may materialize at that time uh, between then and, and when power actually flows, right? You know, uh, up to two, almost, you know, up to two hours later. Um, and so what we're seeing in this graph here, especially you're looking at the, the evening net load uh, peak hours, only 16 to, to 22, Looking at the red solid line, that's 2023 uh, adjustments to the hour ahead market load forecast. We see that those adjustments, to the hour market forecast, are significantly higher than the adjustments than the adjustments made to the load forecast in the five minute market, and that's the dotted red line there for 2023. Uh, for the the kind of largest hourly average adjustment for the year was hourly 19. Uh, in in the hour market, that adjustment upward adjustment to the load forecast was 1,820 megawatts on average, uh, whereas the adjustment to the five minute market load forecast uh, on average that hour was only about 400 megawatts. So, if you and and so in terms of getting back to the story of why the F 50 minute market prices were higher than the five minute market prices on average during these evening peak net load hours, uh, I want to note here that. It, for mo most hours, operators did the same adjustment to load forecast, a very similar adjustment to the load forecast in the 15 minute market as they did to the hour ahead market. So looking at this, uh, this solid red line, let's think about that as also being just about uh, the average adjustment that operators made to the 15 minute market load forecast. So thinking about basic uh, kind of supply and demand, how that leads to prices. Uh, if you have a much higher demand in the 15 minute market, Right, so the, the 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 operators are increasing the the load in the in the hour and fifty minute market by, you know, fourteen hundred megawatts more than they're increasing load in the five minute market. That's going to, on average, push up prices to be significantly higher on average in the fifty minute market than in the five minute market. Uh, so this operator intervention um, again was was a significant contributor to what we talked about in the you know boy the first few slides here of this talk today. Uh, so this was a significant contributor to uh, the day ahead and 15 minute market prices uh, being higher on average than the uh, than the five minute market prices, um, you know, both through, through kind of throughout the year um, and in Q3 in particular, but then also uh, just, you know, stood that the most of that difference in prices was driven during these peak uh, net load hours here when this when 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 this difference in the in the uh, in, in the operator 
load forecast adjustment uh, was 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 highest. Um, and again, so I guess to, to kind of finish that off again, so this is this is again one of the two factors uh, that that contributed to 50 minute market prices in Kaiso being higher than five minute market prices. The other being what we just talked about in the last slide, uh, which was the the uh, the limitation to the uh, dynamic WM transfers into Kaiso in the 50 minute market that were not uh, done in the five minute market during peak net load hours uh, from late July through uh, mid November. All right. Um, so operators can, uh, well, adjustments, the, the Kaiso balancing error also makes adjustments to the load requirement, the load forecast used in the residual unit commitment process. Uh, so the residual unit commitment process, uh, RUC, this is, uh, it's, this is uh, it's a market that's run after the integrated forward market as part of the data market. Um, and it's intended to uh, procure sufficient capacity to meet uh, you know, the expected uh, needs in real time. And so coming out of the integrated foreign market, the more financial market in the data market, uh, the, the amount of kind of cleared, cleared physical supply may not, may not equal the load forecast. And so the, the RUC, RUC runs uh, right after that IFM. Um, and it, as a baseline, it uses the load forecast to help ensure that the amount of physical capacity uh, that has a must offer obligation coming out of the overall day and market is sufficient to meet uh, the load forecast in real time. But uh, this, the, the, KISO, the, the KISO balancing area will do adjustments to that RUC load forecast in order to deal with, in order to get extra capacity to, to uh, account for uncertainty that will, you know, that can materialize between uh, the, the day ahead market load forecast and what the, and what the load and net load, right? And, and you know, and, reductions in supply may end up being in real time. So this graph shows the the daily average RUC adjustments, the daily average adjustments to that RUC load forecast um, uh, from 2023, that's the blue bars, blue lines, compared to 2022, which are the red lines. We see that in 2023, uh, the RUC adjustments, even in the first half of, the, half of the year, were significantly higher than the adjustments to that RUC forecast in 2022, red bars. But then in the middle of the year here, we see the, uh, the arrow June 30th, uh, the ISO began using the mosaic quantile regression uh, to calculate the RUC, the RUC adjustments. Uh, and they began to calculate the RUC adjustments to try to cover 97.5%, uh, uh, to try to cover uncertainty that may materialize 97.5% of the time. So to, kind of, to cover the 97.5th percentile of net load error between the day and real time. Uh, and so we see in the second half of 2023, using this mosaic quantile regression set to cover 97.5 percent of uncertainty, uh, that 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 significantly increased the the, the rug adjustments in 2023 compared to 2022, and especially here in the in the, in the fourth quarter, look at October uh, through late December, um, uh, the those those rug adjustments were significantly higher um, in 2023. Um, and that, that did have a con we'll talk about in the next slide. The implications of that were just increased costs, uh, mainly through bid cost recovery, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Um, but then noteworthy here is that in late December, December 21st, I so changed its methodology for calculating the RUC adjustments. So instead of setting that mosaic quantile regression to always cover each hour uh, 90, the 97.5th percentile of uncertainty that may of net load uncertainty that, that may materialize between day and real time, they started using uh, other outside conditions uh, to determine what percentile of uncertainty that RUC adjustment should cover, and so I, you know, I think so. I think this, this, these, the, the, the ISOs, um, uh, 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 adjustments to adjustments that it made to its to its processes for determining the uncertainty, uh, you know, and this RUC adjustment. I think it has. Has significant implications for the extended day head market design, um, and in particular the imbalance reserve up product demand curve. So maybe to, to talk about that a little bit, um, that the currently planned design for the in, imbalance reserve up product demand curve is to have the demand curve set the requirements, kind of the upper or the far end of that demand curve set to tr set to cover 97.5% of uncertainty during all hours. Um, and so what we see here with the ISO 
uh, uh, adjusting its method on December 21st of 2023. I think, you know, the ISO, it, it's, it, it's an indication that, that the amount of additional capacity that's required out of the day and market, you know, which is, you know, which currently they're using RUC adjustments for, but which with the implementation of EDAN, they'll be using imbalance reserve RUC product to procure, that 97.5th percentile is, is, is way too high for most hours. And so the ISO, you know, is now using for its RUC adjustments, uh, it's considering outside conditions to determine, you know, how much uncertainty, you know, should, 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 uh, should, should extra capacity procure the data market cover above, you know, energy, energy, energy schedules. Um, and, it, you know, again, it's, it's it, during most hours at 97.5 97 percentile is too high. So I think the challenge going forward and the challenge for the, EDAM and balance reserve product design is going to be to uh, try to incorporate uh, uh, mathematically or systematically, you know, what, what are those outside conditions? What are the outside conditions which determine, which, you know, which, which, which the operators are currently using to determine how much extra capacity is needed, how much uncertainty should be covered? Um, I think that's a, that's a challenge that the ISOs uh, and stakeholders are going to need to, uh, to, try, to, to try to address um, in the EDAM design. Uh, because there's because as currently designed, that imbalance reserve product uh, demand curve could be way too high during most hours, and because uh, imbalance reserve product is procured uh, in the IFM or in the integrated forward market, uh, that will have a significant upward impact on 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 day ahead market energy prices. Um, so I think it is important for the for the ISO uh, to kind of use the lessons it's learning um, from the mosaic quantile regression and what the actual needs are for additional capacity uh, to, to, uh, to, to try to work on, on improvements to that uh, the imbalance reserve up uh, product demand curve so that we don't, so that when that gets implemented, we don't have uh, 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 prices that are, that are excessively high in EDM. All right, any questions on that? We do have one question in the audio queue. This is a Jake Wong from PGE. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hi, Ryan. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, this is not the first time we see this graph. Every time is interesting. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, inquire a little bit more on your comments of uh, your suggestion of reducing the, uh, the requirement of the imbalance reserve estimation using this method. Um, one difference I, I didn't notice is because this uh, this is used as a low conformance in the rug, uh, which does not have other products. Uh, while we put it in the IFM, there will be virtues and um, there will be demand curve as, as well. Um, do you have any in, insights on, on these um, factors and how it's going to interact? Because I, I'm, I'm asking because, you know, originally, there were considerations of actually setting the requirement even higher uh, for the reliability considerations, um, but it seems the data actually suggests the other way. So uh, just I'm just curious of your insights on this. You yeah that that I mean that that that's that would, that question took a long time to answer. So I think we've 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 written a lot of we've written a lot of comments on how the interaction of virtual bids um, in the EDM market could could you know could result. In uh, you know could could kind of could could result in adverse impacts uh, in in EDAM um, um, if the if the imbalance reserve up product demand curve is too high. Uh, so it's yes, yeah, so it's not just a matter of, of you know costs that are too high. It's that you know that virtual supply could come in and arbitrage and arbitrage those uh, and 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 kind of and 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 undermine the effectiveness of 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 that of that demand curve if the demand curve is too high. Uh, that's probably too complex to, to get into in detail here, but you can see DMM's uh, public comments on that in the EDAM and imbalance reserve uh, and DAM E uh, stakeholder initiative comments. Okay, so you're saying like even considering those issues, uh, sorry, the factors of virtues and demand curves, it will actually you believe will um, make the make this um, requirement worse, not the other way around. Yeah, I guess, I mean, this, I guess the easy way of saying is just that having a demand curve, which is, which is too high, which is higher 
than uh, than the actual value of procuring additional capacity above energy schedules in the day market could in the IFM could have you know could could have detrimental impacts, even you know okay. even with virtuals. Yeah, virtual virtual bids won't, won't virtual bids won't, won't alleviate that. Uh, and I think uh, there is an argument, and we've there's another one of recommendations is 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 to consider having this amount of zero product move entirely into the residual unit commitment process and out of the integrated forward market. That might that might that might help uh, because a lot of the procurement of capacity is still going to have to uh, still going to have to occur in ruck even with the imbalance reserve uh, product design. Um, so again, that's a, a kind of extension of the recommendation. Yeah, yeah, I did read that part. Um, I have more to discuss. Uh, thank you very much. Yep, yep. Thanks. Okay. Um, so this graph is showing bid cost recovery. Uh, payments uh, in uh, broken out by, by category for 2022 and 2023, monthly bid cost recovery payments. The yellow bar shows bid cost recovery payments in the real time to non-CAISO WAM areas. Uh, and then the blue bars show bid cost recovery payments in the, uh, in the day ahead market to CAISO. Green bars are real-time bid cost recovery payments in CAISO. And the red bars are big cost recovery payments associated with residual unit commitment process. So um, big cost recovery payments in the California ISO balancing area uh, increased to the highest value since 2011. That's total $289 million. That's up from uh, $255 million in 2022. And that's uh, right, that increases despite the significantly lower gas costs in 2023 that we've, we talked about earlier on in the talk. Uh, so the the drivers of big cost recoveries, so those other the real time and day ahead categories in the CAISO balancing area, those big cost recovery costs actually went down from 2022 to 2023. So that that uh, was a 34 million dollar increase uh, in BCR and CAISO was you know mainly was basically due to uh, uh, the increase in RUC bid cost recovery. So RUC bid cost recovery increased by 60 million dollars in 2023 compared to 2022, uh, and we think that most of that can be uh, attributed. To the increase in those in those adjustments to the uh, rec load requirement that I talked about in the last slide, uh, WAM bid cost recovery was uh, about thirty three million dollars in twenty twenty three, and that's down from uh, forty two million dollars in twenty twenty two. Again, jumping back jumping back to Kaiso here, that two hundred eighty nine million dollars in bid cost recovery in the Kaiso balancing area that was two point two percent of total wholesale energy costs. Which is up significantly from uh, from BCR only being about 1.4 percent of total wholesale costs in 2022. All right, so uh, we talked about the mosaic quantile regression being implemented uh, uh, to uh, to to determine the uncertainty portion of the RUC adjustment there, but the mosaic quantile regression method was also implemented for uh, estimating uncertainty for the flexible ramping product. Uh, and also the, res the WAM resource efficiency evaluation. Um, so the mosaic quantile regression method, it, it, you know, it, it comes up with an uncertainty estimate. Uh, part of the implementation was to implement uh, thresholds, so both ceiling and floors, uh, uh, onto the, uh, those uncertainty estimates that come out of the underlying mosaic quantile regression. Uh, and, this, and the idea is that you, you know, the ceilings and, and floors could be applied to address uh, situations where the uh, mosaic quantile regression, the raw mosaic quantile regression results uh, uh, were, were kind of too high or too low to, to, to really be reasonable. Um, this chart shows the frequency that those thresholds were applied for the flexible ramping product uh, pass group uncertainty requirement. Uh, so again, that's the, this is the, it's essentially the uncertainty portion of the demand curve for the, the WAM pass group for the flexible ramping product. Um, the blue bar here shows uh, the percentage of intervals in which the uh, a ceiling, the requirement that the ceiling was 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 applied to the requirement. The yellow bar shows the percentage of intervals in which the floor was applied uh, uh, to the uh, to, to the uncertainty that came out of the raw mosaic quantile regression method. Uh, we're seeing uh, this, uh, the percentage of intervals which the thresholds are applied in the 50 minute market on the left and the five minute market on the right. So um, the floor, uh, the floor for the for the uncertainty requirement is basically zero. So yellow bars show that the percentage of intervals in which in which the the raw output of the mosaic quantile regression was basically less than zero or less than 0.1 megawatts. Um, and so we think you know 
this 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 overall both the blue and yellow bars looking at this metric for how often the thresholds are applied is probably a probably a good ongoing metric to kind of look at whether or not uh uh, there are improvements that could still be still be made in that underlying was a quantile regression regression uh, 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 model, right? So, uh, for instance, the floor being being just about zero, uh, one would ex you know what we would expect that there's always going to be upward uncertainty. There's always going to be some downward uncertainty, and so if that if the if the mosaic quantile regression method is is coming up with results that are kind of below 0.1 megabytes, below zero, that's you know that's, that's clearly not reasonable. So it's good to have the floor, but I think the percentage of time which that the the floor threshold is used as an indication of improvements that could be made to the uh, to the regression method. Similarly, the ceiling uh, the ceiling is based on the top one percent of outlier uh, 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 uncertainty results in the previous six months. So one would expect that you know on average you would that that ceiling the ceiling threshold would be applied about one percent of intervals. Uh, what we're seeing here. Uh, for the 15 minute market overall, the thresholds were applied during 10% of intervals in the five minute market the, uh, the thresholds overall thresholds were applied during 9% uh, of intervals. And so, it, given that we would expect kind of the ceilings to, uh, to only trigger about 1% of the time, uh, having, having, you know, the, the, again, most of these thresholds are ceilings, having the ceilings hit around 10% or 9% of the time, uh, indicates, um, uh, that, that, that the mosaic quantile regression method. Uh, is coming up with kind of unreasonably high results uh, during a significant number of intervals, and, and and so it indicates that there there could still be improvements made uh, to that method. We do note that ISO has has made a lot of improvements uh, uh, to that method, but uh, I think it's something that continues uh, to warrant monitoring and uh, continued uh, work on enhancements. So you stop for questions at this point. We have a question in the chat from Matthew Leifer. Could you ask how reducing the RUC adjustments requirements interact with the KISO IFM forecast and virtuals? Oof. You know, hey, let's have you know, let's let's start having people. If you have questions, let's let's have them dial in. Or we uh, do have. We do, oh, sorry, we do have a, a question dialed in, but this okay, is just okay. the first one. Yeah, yeah, just because yeah, it's it's hard. It's you know, I'm not I'm not reading those questions, and if there's clarifying questions, it'd be best to have the person just uh, dial in and and ask ask in person. So yeah, so let's let, let's let's take the question from the from the phone. Okay. Okay. Hi, Alan Mac, pg &E. hey. Um, I, I wanted to go back uh, a couple of slides to your discussion with uh, J.K. about um the yeah about the ruck adjustments and the implications for the imbalanced reserve product. I I just want to be really clear. I think what I'm hearing you say is that. The way that the imbalanced reserve product is structured is the way that RUC is being procured from July to December of 2023. Yep. And so as currently structured, this is kind of like a massive iceberg that we're all kind of like slowly heading towards unless we fix it. Am I hearing you right? Uh, I, I would say, I mean, I, so the the ISO has implemented uh, caps on the demand curve. Uh, that's when, that's part of the design. So that will that will help. Right. Uh, so it's not just a pure. It's the demand curve is not just based purely on the ninety seven point fifth percentile. The caps will help. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, even with those caps, I think the you know the caps don't apply to the, the far end of the demand curve, um, which is what the ninety seven point percent ninety seven point fifth percentile represents. So no, yeah, I mean the point is that I think what we're seeing here is the ISO has recognized that that that. 97.5 percentiles is is too high for most hours. It's probably it might be too low during some of the during the during the really highest hours, right? But during most hours, that may be too high, and it could, and it could significantly increase the cost. So, yeah, so it'd be worthwhile to uh, consider to think about uh, how 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 to uh, how to better incorporate and incorporate the kind of the what 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 some of these outside conditions, what some of these other drivers are of the need for capacity and excess of energy schedules. Because it's not just it's not just meeting some really high percentage of net load uncertainty. That's helpful. Thank you. Yep. Um, second question, um, specifically with respect to your recommendation that maybe we need to consider moving a balance reserve into RUC. I recall once upon a time and long, long ago, the original problem statement that imbalance reserve supposedly was set out to cure was that we're having problems with trying to procure flexibility to cover the net load uncertainty in RUC because RUC is a very blunt force instrument. 
that is just going to stack resources from from cheapest to most expensive and it's just going to start taking the cheapest off the top um, regardless of whether or not those resources might actually be able to provide flexibility and so it's a, it's a very imprecise and poorly calibrated tool for doing what we need imbalanced reserve to do and so if now we're talking about moving imbalanced reserve back into RUC, are we are we solving any problems anymore like it, it seems it seems strange to me or is that not the concern anymore yeah i, I mean i i think i think it's probably, there's a whole there's a whole lot of a whole lot of uh, competing arguments that we've, that we've heard in the stakeholder process for you know for for, for whether or not you would you would procure a malice reserve product in the ifm or ruck so i i i say you know given given some other stuff i need to go over let's i let's maybe that that's that's probably a better discussion for the uh for stakeholder initiative, or, but also, Alan, so that's, that I would also be happy to have a discussion with you offline too. And, I, and, I, okay. and, I, and I, in fact, I forgot to say that to everybody on, on this call. Uh, you know, covering a ton of material in this on the, on the, in these two hours here. Um, but DMM is what we 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 love having uh, conversations with 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 people, uh, setting up individual calls with people to to discuss uh, concerns they may have about market design, market performance, and it's, you know, especially anything that comes up in, in, in our annual in our reports. This presentation, let's. Uh, have a set up a call to discuss. Okay. Fair yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Al. Uh, so I'm gonna look at the clock. I'm um, realize I'm I might be running short on time. That's a that's a, that's a more that's a that's a very detailed discussion to get into at this point. <laughs> Thanks. And, any other questions? That was that was Alan who just asked the question. Then no, we have no more questions in queue. Okay. Okay. So uh, this graph is showing the real time imbalance costs. For the last three years, broken out by component, uh, we see, uh, and so real time imbalance costs are generated, are are caused by in the real time market when the money that gets paid out to generation and load in the real time market is more than than the money paid in to the real time market, uh, you know, by by generation and load, and so that results in an, in an, in a market of revenue imbalance when which, which must be allocated out uh, to load. And exports, 2023. So the 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 largest cause of uh, these imbalance offset costs uh, continues to be congestion. That's the green bars here, uh, and we uh, most of that congestion, most of those congestion offset costs continue to be caused by the constraint limits of resources in uh, the constraint limits of transmission constraints, transmission elements in the real time market being lower than the limits used for those. Those uh, those transmission elements in the in the day end market, but I want to focus on this slide on the energy portion of the real time imbalance Im offset costs. Those are the blue bars. So you notice that those costs were really those en the energy portion of the costs were went up extreme were extremely high in 2022. Right, so 119 million dollars in 2022. In 2023, those the energy portion of the imbalance costs continued to be really high, about 101 million dollars. Uh, DMM did a did a, uh, a a deep analysis of potential of one of the, the major causes of this, um, and we produced a paper in 2023 explaining that a, a, a major a major source of the of of, of these energy imbalance imbalance costs uh, where it has a, a systematic difference and it was it was a, it's a it's a it's a part of the design it's a planned it's a plan, it's it's part of the ISO's design so it's not a, it's not an inflation error but there's a there's a systematic difference between the price paid to generation and the price. Uh, paid by load in real time, right? Generation gets paid and say a generator has a change in schedule from the day in the 15 minute market. That change in generation gets settled on the FMM price. Then change in the generator schedule from RTD to FMM gets settled on the RTD price. And similarly, a change in meet, a generator's metered schedule or, you know, it's meter generation to RTD that gets settled on the RTD price. So it's, generators have incremental, uh, this, this incremental megawatts get settled on the market on the exact precise market price for each of the incremental markets. Load gets settled on an average price, an average price uh, between FMM and RTD. Um, and without getting into too many details here, that 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 does that does create in some situations, such as when metered load is different from RTD load, that that kind of average price can create uh, a situation where load is not is is not paid. It does not pay in the same price that generation gets paid, which can create a revenue imbalance. Uh, and, and and then this gets exacerbated by a, a design decision. And, ex, and when prices, when that average price is extreme, is extremely high, extremely low, 
The ISO then has a different method of settling load, which is to use the absolute value of, of load differences between the markets. Um, and and that, that then has a very large disconnect between the price that load uh, pays and that generation gets paid. So that's been the major driver of the uh, this blue bars, the energy portion of the real-time balance uh, offset costs uh, in the last couple of years. Um, we continue to recommend that the ISO adjust its design to settle to settle load uh, incrementally, the incremental load between the markets on on the on right on the, on the subsequent market on, on the actual market prices, as opposed to using these kind of average or absolute value based prices. Um, a second uh, cause of the energy portion of these imbalance costs in 2023 was actually an error in the settlement price used for Kaiso load. Um, uh, Kyle Westendorf of, uh, of DMM did some extensive analysis of, of this of this issue. Um, and this, it was caused by, and it was, it was, it was just a, a, a it was a settlement error. Uh, uh, the actual load in the Kaiso balancing area, uh, when, when, in order to calculate the settlement price for load, that get, that has to be first distributed out to different load areas. That distribution of load was incorrect for much of, for, for about February, 2023 to February, 2024. And so that did result in incorrect settlement prices. Uh, we'll note that that did not. It did not impact the optimization, right? The correct load was using the optimization. It didn't. It didn't impact the actual amount of megawatts that that each, that loads are going to be settled on, but it did impact the price. Uh, and there were some significantly uh, there were some significant pricing errors. But because sometimes load these loads are going to be settled on prices that were too high, other times settled on prices that were too low. Those errors, you know, Kyle's analysis did show that errors did errors did average out over time. So that the total impact on load serving entities we estimate is only about eleven million dollars. And then because that gets allocated to load serving entities and a lot of it gets allocated to the entities who had you know the underpayments to begin with the overall impact was only about seven million dollars um but the iso is has implemented a fix for that and they are going to resettle that incorrect uh, load settlement okay um the iso also had uh an implementation error in how it allocated uh the congestion rents and congestion costs from uh, from the congestion in the five minute market on WEIM transfer constraints, uh, and that error occurred. Implementation errors from June twenty sixth to December eleventh, twenty twenty three. This graph uh, shows the WEIM daily five minute market component of the of the congestion offset calculation by congestion type. Um, and so the ISO again this this error was only on uh, the congestion rent and congestion charges in the five minute market. Um, the ISO uh, did, re did correction and resettlement of about $5 million in misallocation of this, this congestion, these congestion costs in the WIM uh, from November 5th. Um, the ISO, is, our latest, our understanding is the ISO is not going to go back and try to correct the misallocation for all intervals from June 26th to December 11th. And so we did, uh, we, we tried to do an estimate of kind of what the upper bound of the, of the kind of misallocated congestion rents and charges would be, and that's the red bars. The red bars in this graph, uh, because again, this 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 uh, this implementation error did was only in the five minute market, and it was only on WM transfer constraints. It was not for the green bars, which is the scheduling limits. It was not for the yellow, which is the internal constraint congestion. It's just the WM transfer constraints, and we estimate that the total amount of these congestion uh, payments from the ISO from these transfer constraints in five minute market was about twelve million twelve million dollars in payments to the ISO with the positive side red bars was about five million dollars uh, sorry seven million dollars so the total maximum error was about it could be about nineteen million dollars but again I want to emphasize that that's that's a maximum we we don't we don't know whether or not you know it's it's unlikely that the error impacted all nineteen million dollars of this congestion rent so that that is just a, a, an upper estimate we thought it'd be it's it's worth um, communicating that to the market that, that it was an error. So the ISO, uh, one of the kind of the major market design uh, enhancements implemented in 2023 was the nodal procurement of the flexible ramping product. Uh, this graph shows the frequency with which the upward flexible ramping market, flexible, <laughs> the upward flexible ramping product prices in the 15 minute market at, on a system level. This shows the percentage of intervals in which that, that the, the, those prices on the system level were non-zero. So prior to the implementation of nodal flexible ramping product on February 1st, we're using this was kind of the old system constraint. Uh, and then to the right here on the graph, February 1st, we're seeing 
um, the upward, the upward uh, 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 non-zero, the percentage intervals in which the past group constraint for the flexible ramping product uh, was non-zero. Uh, the blue shows, uh, sorry, the upward flexible ramping product. The green shows the downward flexible ramping product in the 15-minute market percentage intervals in which, again, which, which the, the price was non-zero for the past group constraint. And takeaway from this is that, um, is that the, the, the frequency of non-zero upward system prices in the 50-minute market did increase slightly. You can see that in this graph. Slight increase about 0.8% of 50-minute market intervals had non-zero upward FRP past group shadow prices since the enhancements. Um, but the, but the, the FRP downward prices, both the 50-minute and 5-minute market prices, and the upward 5-minute five minute, uh, five prices uh, uh, continued to be non-zero in about 0.1% of intervals or less. So uh, that last that last graph uh, showed uh, just showed the percentage percentage of intervals when that when the, the kind of the system the past group constraint for FRP uh, uh, was non-zero. That's the blue bars in this graph. Blue, the blue bars in the bottom of this graph. So this graph also adds on to that, right? So this is a this is a nodal procurement. It's a nodal product, um, and so to kind of show that we want to get get a little bit better view here on in terms of how often are there any nodes in in the group of WIM areas that pass the RSE test, all the areas that are in the pass group, how often is there is there a, a, a positive price on any positive FRP price on any node? So this shows uh, the frequency of, of upward flex ramp price uh, when you know when when those are positive on any node uh, uh, again in the fifty in the fifteen minute market. And so we do see here that most of the time when you do have a a, a positive price on a node. When the pass group constraint is not binding, so those are the non-blue colors here. Usually, the prices, those positive prices, are just in one balancing area. But I think it is noteworthy here that that we do see. You know, it's not it's not just 0.8 percent of intervals when you when you when we get some some kind of some kind of positive price on any node from the nodal FRP. Uh, it, you know, and some especially in that kind of the spring, summer, fall months, we can get a significant number of intervals where we are getting some uh, some positive prices in the 50 minute market for upward FRP. Okay, uh, so DMM, uh, we do a, in order to assess competitiveness of the market, uh, each day we do a rerun using a version of the, of the, of the market software in the day ahead market, we do a rerun uh, of the mar day ahead market using, uh, using cost-based bids for our resources. So we put in uh, estimates of cost for each resource for the energy bids and commitment cost bids plus a 10% adder. Um, and we'll also use the hydro default energy bid for imports. So the results, the weighted average price average by month for that, that competitive baseline run of the blue bars here. Uh, and then we also rerun the market using the bid submitted by market participants and the, the to get the, to get the, 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 the prices in the dead market using, using, uh, using the bid submitted by market participants and that the markup above the competitive baseline here is shown by the red bars in this graph. Uh, for 2023, uh, we're seeing here that the the total markup um, uh, you, you know, from from bids submitted by participants over the year was on average only about uh, two dollars and sixty eight cents per megawatt hour above the uh, the competitive baseline, which is about three point six percent markup, and that's comparing as a, a lower markup, uh, right, two sixty eight less than the three dollars and four cents per megawatt hour markup from 2022. So this metric helps us. Uh, uh, to to uh, to conclude that the ISO's energy markets were generally competitive overall in uh, in 2023, right? The energy price is about equal to competitive baseline prices. We also do a uh, we also assess the competitiveness of the markets using a structural market power test. So to do this, we we calculate a residual supply index, which is uh, it's a ratio. The numerator is the supply in the market left over after taking away the largest supplier of power. It's the RSI one. Uh, the numerator, if you take away the supply from the two largest suppliers, you get the RSI 2. If you take away the, the power supply from the three largest supplier, you get the RSI 3. The denominator is the uh, the load uh, for each hour of the day in the day at market. And so the test here is if the, if you take away the one, two, or three largest suppliers, if the, if the residual supply left over there in the numerator is sufficient to meet the, the demand, uh, then you're going to get an RSI greater than one. If the supply left over after taking away the largest suppliers is less than one, uh, then, then, you know, then that, 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 you know, then that's not worthy as, as there being not sufficient supply after taking large suppliers to cover demand as an indication of, of a non-competitive situation. In 2023, uh, we see that the, 
the structural competitors of the market is very similar to 2022. Um, particularly here, you look at the, of 2023, the RSI 3 was less than 1 for 132 of hours in 2023. That's compared to 524 hours when the RSI 3 was less than 1, right? So, so 524 hours in 2020. Uh, we're potentially structurally uncompetitive using uh, taking away the three largest suppliers and then looking at the RSI 1. So, taking away the largest supplier, uh, uh, there's not enough leftover residual supply to meet demand in 2023 during only 26 hours. And that's compared to the RSI 1 uh, 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 signaled structural potential structural uncompetitiveness during 129 hours in 2020. Moving on to uh, congestion rent. Uh, so this graph shows day ahead market congestion rent on the inner ties. Uh, the breakdown in the colored bars is the breakdown of the day ahead market congestion rent by inner tie. Uh, the white and gray bars to the right of the color bars that that's the breakdown of the of the uh, day ahead market congestion rent between imports and exports. Uh, noteworthy here is that the total inner tie congestion rent it decreased to forty seven million dollars in twenty twenty three down from $181 million in congestion rent in 2022 and $105 million of uh, intertie data congestion rent in 2021. Uh, but the export congestion rent did increase in 2023. So export congestion rent uh, uh, was only in the gray bar and under 2022, that was only uh, $7 million in 2022, but the export congestion rent increased to $13 million in 2023. The largest increase in the export congestion rent was on Malin. Uh, next, this graph shows the average impact of impact of internal constraint congestion on the price separation between major load areas. Uh, on average, right, the the impact of internal constraint congestion on 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 the on the on the prices of major load areas in Kaiso decreased on average in 2023. But you know that that is kind of a symptom of of because right, that average impact does net off uh, positive price impacts and negative imp and negative impacts over the year. So that does you know kind of depend on 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 how often. The congestion is changing directions throughout the year. Uh, so, but uh, the data congestion from internal constraints did decrease significantly in 2023. It was down $66 million in 2023 compared to 2022. And that's despite the, the frequency of uh, congestion, the frequency of intervals in which congestion impacted, uh, you know, created price separation between the, the major load areas did, did uh, increase in 2023. Uh, increased to, so the, the percent of hours for internal congestion separated prices between major load areas, it increased to 51% in 2023, up from uh, 36% in 2022. Uh, this graph is on uh, congestion revenue rates. So the, this chart shows the uh, transmission rate payers lost about $59 million from auction CRRs in 2023, receiving only about 76 cents per dollar uh, paid out to the buyers of those congestion revenue rates. So the blue bars uh, show the auction revenues received by transmission rate payers. The green bars show the payments out to those auction CRRs, you know, from transmission rate payers to the to the buyers of those CRRs. Uh, the difference between those two is shown by the yellow line for each year. And those are those represent the losses to uh, to transmission rate payers from the from the CR auction. Uh, so, fifty nine million dollars losses in twenty twenty three down is down a little bit from twenty twenty two. But it's still a, sniff, uh, a significant amount of losses to transmission rate payers from the CR auction design. Uh, we do want to note here that so significant CR reforms are implemented in, in 2019, in particular is the track 1B revenue deficiency offset, right? That limited the payouts to uh, congestion revenue rights uh, in the day market to only the congestion rent that, that is accrued on each constraint in the day market for each hour. Uh, so we estimate that that, that, that enhancement first started in 2019, that did. Uh, uh, reduced payments to, to non-load serving entity auction CRRs by about $97 million. So it decreased losses by about $97 million in 2023. You kind of see that those enhancements 2019 did have, you know, have had a significant impact. So on average, before those enhancements, losses uh, to, to transmission rate payers were about $114 million a year. Since those enhancements, losses are only about $62 million a year. But again, still significant losses uh, to, uh, to transmission rate payers from the CR auction design. So uh, DMM does continue to recommend that the ISO consider uh, uh, more, even more significant uh, changes to the CR auction design. In particular, team recommends that the ISO uh, eliminate the current auction, the current CR auction design, which is based on uh, auctioning out an amount of CRRs based on the amount of expected transmission capacity available. This, in essence, this design in essence forces transmission rate payers to offer to sell a large number of congestion revenue rights with a zero dollar reservation price. 
Uh, instead, DMM recommends replacing that, that CR auction with an auction with an auction design, which will which which only has sales from willing sellers of CRRs. So an auction design which would allow any seller of CRRs to set their own reservation price. In particular, right, one idea would be to would be to, a design that, that could work would be to have an auction design where the amount of CRRs that clear at each node, you have to have the, the equal amount of CR sourced at each node to the amount of CRs that sink at each node. This would then ensure that uh, that that CRRs are only sold and bought and sold between willing counterparties uh, in contrast to the current CR auction design. Uh, so your service. Uh, so it's our service costs decreased in 2023 relative to 2022. You see that the uh, the blue bars there uh, in terms of the the decrease in cost per megawatt hour of load served. Uh, cost of percent of energy costs decreased down slightly down to about one percent. Uh, what's noteworthy here in 2023 uh, is that uh, starting in March, uh, the CAISO uh, 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 stopped procuring. Uh, uh, the re operating reserves in equal proportion between spinning and non-spinning reserves uh, due to a change in NERC requirements. So starting March 1st, CAISO balancing error started procuring uh, uh, only about 20% of the total operating reserve requirement from spinning reserves and another 80% from non-spinning reserves. Uh, and so obviously spinning reserves are typically more expensive than non-spinning reserves that, that did contribute to decreasing the overall cost of installer services. Uh, last couple of graphs here before we're talking about a couple of recommendations. Um, resource adequacy. So the resource adequacy program is a really important, uh, you know, state-run resource adequacy program is really, really important aspect of the KISO wholesale market design in terms of ensuring sufficient, uh, reliable capacity uh, and, and, and contributing to the competitiveness, having, you know, ex excess supply to contribute to the competitiveness of wholesale market results. Uh, this graph shows average load, that's the gray line, and then average RA capacity procured, the red line, uh, for July and August. Actually, this shows for, for all 2023 emergency notification hours, in particular, focus on this orange bar here for July. Uh, these were, there were 12 hours in July. Those are the only 12 hours of the year where the KISO balancing area declared an EAA, e, an energy emergency alert watch hour or greater. Uh, there was, I think, one hour, a couple hours of EAA level one. Um, so, but during these hours, you note that the average load in KISO is about 39 gigawatts, whereas the uh, RA capacity procured was about uh, 52 gigawatts, again, on average over these 12 hours. So the procured capacity was uh, was sufficient to cover load. Um, say, you know, maybe a maybe more interesting metric is whether or not the actual, the, the amount of capacity that was bid in and available uh, from RA resources was sufficient to cover the instantaneous peak uh, plus the upward and sort of service requirements. So, right, the instantaneous peak was August 16th, hour 18. Uh, total load plus operating reserve regulation up was about 47,944 megawatts. Uh, bids from RA resources in the real time market were over 53,000 megawatts, right? So that included solar, wind, and other schedules that were in excess of uh, resources, resource adequacy capacity. So the RA capacity did provide sufficient coverage of the annual instantaneous peak load. And then let's see, last slide before talking about a couple, a couple more recommendations. Uh, this just shows the average total system resource adequacy capacity, availability, and performance by system emergency notification category. Uh, I guess noteworthy here is looking at the 2023, the last row here, EA watch plus hours, the kind of the 12 hours, uh, which we had the EA watch level or higher. Uh, we continue to see a, uh, a high percentage of resource adequacy, adequacy capacity that was available and bid into the market in the, both the data and real time market during tight system conditions. Okay, uh, boy, six minutes left. So talk about some of, uh, some of our, I guess so. This the listed on these slides, I think, are this, uh, highlighted some of our, what we think are DMS most important recommendations, ongoing recommendations. Uh, I'll just talk about a few more of these now. Uh, for the extended day ahead market, where you talked a lot <laughs> about the inbound reserve product demand curve, so I'll leave that to what was already said. Um, we can. This is a longstanding recommendation for DMM. It does relate to EDM as well. Now, is that to develop a real time product uh, covering uncertainty several hours out. Into the future. So currently, the FRP flexible ramping product only covers uncertainty maybe up to about an hour out. Um, but uh, so we recommend that the ISO develop 
either extending the flexible revenue product time horizon to go out, you know, several hours, maybe up to four hours, or develop a simpler, even maybe a potentially more simpler product to cover uncertainty further out. And uh, uh, that we then that could enhance price formation, but also in, in the context of EDAM, uh, it's not that that's also needed in order to retain the imbalance reserves, which are procured in EDAM. Without without a, an uncertainty product that looks further out, uh, a lot of those imbalance reserves may you know may 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 not may not be able to be utilized. Um, let's see. So, a couple other recommendations. So, the EDAM has a requirement for uh, that. Uh, 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 capacity used to meet the EDAM resource efficiency evaluation from resource specific resources in one EDAM balancing area to meet the RC for another area have to be on firm transmission. Uh, that could, uh, we've written we've written a lot about this that you know that that could potentially uh, uh, create market power. That, that 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 rule could potentially create market power in the EDAM RSC market if if there is if the holders of firm transmission uh, if there is market power in that in, in that market for uh, for firm transmission. The holders of the firm transmission could access market power in the RSC capacity market, by, you know, potentially by by requiring ent entities who want uh, generation over that firm transmission to right to 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 buy the capacity from the holders of the transmission. Um, and so we recommend the ISO kind of, and we'll we'll contribute this to monitor that that potential situation and consider uh, working with other balancing areas in the West, potentially even uh, revise e-tagging rules and the timing of, of releasing firm transmission to help potentially alleviate. That issue, uh, the flip side of that is that uh, non resource specific resources used to meet RSC requirements. Uh, there, there, there's, we think the rules could potentially allow a potential double counting of resources. Um, and so we do, we, we, we think that the ISO should, um, should, uh, should consider, you know, consider clarifying rules and, and, uh, uh, which, which may help prevent, uh, resources. Uh, in EDAM balancing areas, which have already been used to count towards the EDAM RSC from ultimately supporting being the source of 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 uh, uh, of, of the power that uh, that supports non source non resource specific um, imports that are also used uh, to count towards one BA's um, uh, uh, RSC test. Let's see, I already talked about the congestion revenue rights recommendation. So we also have several. Uh, important recommendations related to batteries. Uh, we, we've continued recommending this, uh, this is actually an ongoing stakeholder initiative now, which I think the ISO is addressing. Uh, so, you know, we recommend the ISO revise bid cost recovery rules to eliminate uh, BCR eligibility when the state of charge constraints cause uneconomic schedules. Uh, we also continue to recommend and uh, a longstanding recommendation is that the ISO enhance default energy bids for batteries to allow those default energy bids to, to vary throughout the day based on current opportunity costs. And I think as, as hope is being discussed in that initiative, the, 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 uh, enhancing those default energy bids to, you know, to vary throughout the day uh, becomes even more important if you, it, at, as you start talking about uh, reducing the eligibility of, of batteries for bid cost recovery. Uh, I mean, also an important recommendation is for batteries in WIM. There is no standardized default energy bid. Every battery in, in WIM that, uh, that, um, that, that wants a default energy bid has to apply for a negotiated default energy bid. So it's important that ISO uh, designs a standardized default energy bid for batteries in WIM. And then finally, uh, for batteries, hybrid resources uh, currently uh, are not subject to market power mitigation. So we recommend that ISO extend local market power mitigation to hybrid resources. Um, for price formation enhancements, I already talked about extending the flexible ramping product time horizon. Talked about that in the EDAM. I talked about the EDAM recommendations. Uh, that is again important ongoing recommendation. Also, uh, we, it, really, we think it could really enhance uh, efficiency to reoptimize ancillary services in real time, as opposed to just co -op, you know, currently ancillary services uh, are just co-optimized with energy in the day ahead market. So to do that full co-optimization, reoptimization of ancillary services in real time could be uh, an enhancement to the to uh, to the market efficiency. And uh, this is an important one also. Uh, we recommend that ISO fix the maximum import bid price shaping factor. The fact, so the fact that that converts uh, the bilateral multi-hour block price into hourly prices, and that can be important uh, during, the, especially during the first day of a tight period. Uh, the, the current implementation of that maximum import bid price shaping factor could result in the maximum import bid price being being too low uh, compared to what was intended by the design and, uh, and written in the tariff. That's important to fix that so that uh, the uh, the power balance constraint 
penalty price and go up to $2,000, uh, you know, when, 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 when contemplated as appropriate by the current design and also to allow imports and, and batteries to bid over $1,000 during the first day of a tight, tight conditions. Uh, it's noon, so I'll, I will leave it at that. Let's see, uh, sorry, kind of butted up against time there. Do we have any, uh, any final questions? I think Daniel had questions in the chat, but he seems you seem to have answered them throughout the power presentation. Okay. So let's see with that. I guess so. Maybe uh, ask for one one more round of questions. Although I am I, I I do I am sensitive to going over time here for everybody. Um, thanks for sticking with me. Those of you who made it to the full two hours. <laughs> it was a marathon session there. Um, and again, I really, I, I keep, please email us, email me if you can find our information, uh, in our, in, in our reports and on the DMM website. Uh, we, we're more than happy. We, we really like talking to people, um, uh, in individual, individual, uh, sessions. If they have questions about the market, our recommendations of market design and our, 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 uh, and our, our, uh, analysis of market performance. So thank you everyone.